Looks like it's the 13th day of August 2018, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. This is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com, but also heard on a variety of other networks, and of course available further on down the stream by your fondle slab of choice, your applicable application, your podcatcher du jour, etc., etc. Anyway, no matter how it is you're coming to the show, you are welcome. It is a moon day or a Monday uh, on that calendar, too. I know that much. Now, we weren't planning on having Jordan Maxwell on this Monday because he had something else to do, but you know what? Plans change, so guess what? Part 7 of our discussion on religion, uh, and this has been a, a continued series that I'm extremely happy to do. Um, mostly, mostly, I, I really have tried to stay out of Jordan's way, pretty much, <laughs> as much as I can, but, but I have to, you know me, i got to chime in sometimes, and I've got to say a few things here and there. I mean, uh, what, what good is a talk show host who doesn't talk? But, you know, it, it is uh, it is great to have you with us again, Jordan, and I'm very, very happy to uh, to do this with you and, and to continue doing this with you until we're done. We're still not quite sure where the end of this is, are we? No, not really, no, because there's so much uh, that we need to talk about in relation to the Old Testament, and when we're through with that, then we got the whole New Testament, which is a completely, totally different story than what Christians have been told, and so I don't know when we'll get to the end of it. We'll just keep, we'll keep plowing through until we do, and I know that I might uh, perhaps on occasions... Um, uh, um, you know, say things that I've already said and repeat myself. But that's the way I, you know, that's the way I teach. I do this in classes too. And sometimes I'll repeat myself. But I try and uh, to remember everything that's important. So sometimes I do repeat important things. And so uh, mm. you say that, you know, and the reason why you are having me on tonight because I had told you that I wasn't going to be in town. I was supposed to be out of town, but now that fell through, and so here I am and on tonight. Yeah. Right, and again, I do appreciate it. Now, I, I've gotten some feedback from you guys, and I'm going to uh, put the questions to Jordan that you sent me, which you can send me through email. You can go to the live chat room, or if you're on my Skype list, I will answer them. If I can answer them, if they're meant for me, if they're meant for Jordan, I will simply ask him on the show uh, whatever yep. questions you guys pose that are logical and reasonable to the discussion. Okay, yep. so info at Ocelli.com, that's how you can email them if that's the way you want to go. And before we get into this, I also want to remind you that uh, there is only one website, which is Jordan Maxwell's, okay? Uh, there are many people out there that are using his name. There are many websites, whatever, but here is the website to go to, jordanmaxwellshow.com. That's right, all together, one phrase, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, when you go there, that is the only website which is Jordan's, but there is also a button where you can go into the Research Society, and this is where you can get much deeper into a great many topics, including the one we're discussing tonight, but... Believe me, it goes way beyond this. <laughs> okay, one section is very much focused on what it is we've been talking about here, and there is a ton of information there. Ebooks, images, articles, uh, you know, written works of all sorts. Images there that are put together. I've never seen this kind of thing assembled in one place. It's a way to go deeper, farther into these subjects, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little more during this next two hours or, well, a little less now. But either way, jordanmaxwellshow.com is the only website that is Jordan Maxwell's. Got it? Okay. Now, uh, Jordan, did you want to start off with the listener questions? Yes, that sounds good. That'll get us going. Well, let's do that because we inspired some, some stuff that was different this time. Uh, and I don't know if it was from the most recent episode because people are jumping back and forth now. Uh, there, there's a playlist on YouTube which has uh, all of the episodes that we've done. All six parts are up there. Part six was actually split into two parts because uh, I wanted to give it the best sound quality. I thought it was actually the best show that we that, that, that you have put out out of this series, and I wanted to make sure people heard every single thing uh, with, with you know, drop of a pin clarity. So, well, I um, appreciate it, and thank you. No yeah. problem. And, and uh, obviously they're at my website, and if Jordan wants to make them available or put them up on his website, that's between him and his webmaster, but... I will always make this stuff as available as possible. Okay, so 
Uh, some of these questions came from some weird spots. Now, of course, we got a few people who were complaining. You know, why are you picking on the Catholics? And uh, why is it that, uh, you know, you're, you're supporting a, a devil worship think and this kind of thing? And it's like, listen, th- there's no devil worship here. I tried to explain that in the last episode. So I guess you didn't hear that. <laughs> but, yeah, well, uh, I can clarify that again. I don't mind. We can, uh, I have some comments about that if you'd like to start off with that. Well, you know, we could, but really, I'd rather get to the people that are actually thinking about what you're saying and hearing it. But if you if you wish to address it, you know, go go ahead. Uh, There there is no there there is no support of the adversary happening here. (laughs) You know, know. I I know know. that you know that anybody with 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 a mind who is hearing what we're saying uh, certainly knows that. But you know, feel free to address it if you like. Well, I would like to say that first of all, I have. A very high regard for the concept, the very idea of God. Now we can discuss back and forth for the next two two years as to what you mean about God, as opposed to what I, you know, mean when I use the word God. Uh, we need to define our terms any time you're discussing uh, arcane subjects and difficult subjects. You need to. Uh, you know, clarify what you're talking about. The, I am not talking about the Catholic people. My mother and my father and my brother and my whole family were Catholics. My my mom is, my mom my whole family is gone now, and I miss them terribly. But they were all Catholic, and I was too. I was raised Catholic. So I'm not condemning the Catholic people. I'd never condemn my own mother. And I would never condemn all my friends that I had. What I'm saying is that when I was very young, I really had uh, an appetite for learning. I wanted to understand uh, what I believe and why I believe it and be able to talk publicly about it, like the Bible says, be able to defend your belief intelligently, intellectually and intelligently uh, to people who don't believe. And so I really just grew up that way. I just loved knowledge. I wanted to learn why things are the way they are. And if we're going to talk about God and the heavens and the demons and devils and angels, what are you talking about? Well, translate that so I can understand it. And so I used to go to different churches when I was a kid. My mom would let me go to anything I wanted, to any churches I wanted, and I did. All the time I would go with my friends in school to their churches, hoping that I could find someone who was intellectually astute on these kind of questions about theology. And as a little kid, I just wanted to know about God. I want to know. I don't want to believe anything because I know when you believe something, you re- you, you are relying on your own understanding to the best of your ability. So this is what you believe. I don't want to believe. I want to know for a fact. And I want to understand it so I can explain it to others, why I believe something. I I can prove it to an audience of people why I believe something, or or at least show the audience how I came to my different uh, uh, understandings and my different belief systems. So... I have the highest respect for God, so to speak. I know that there is a divine presence in the universe that that men have called God. I refer to it as the Great Spirit. And I believe that there is a divine, intelligent, profoundly wise spirit that governs life on the earth and governs our universe. Mm. And so I don't have any problem with the idea of God. And I love the, the, the nature of the world that we live in, the nature of animals and the, the life forms that we have on the earth. And I realize they didn't just pop in out of nowhere, out of evolution. Right. Someone created all of this beautiful thing that we call our world and our life. And so I don't have any problem with, uh, with bowing to a higher force that men have called God. I, I, I do believe in God. What I am trying to say is that for way too many centuries, organizations, men's personal organizations that they founded and put together, or, or companies and corporations and 
businesses and, and churches and banks and whatever else you want to <clears throat> look at that we humans have put together, we put things together as a business for a purpose, for a reason. And so I, I learned a long time ago from the inside that so much of our belief systems and our government and what we believe about the law enforcement and what we believe about the military and the police department and banks, insurance companies and religions and, and all kinds of things that um, man-made institutions that we use and we believe in uh, are not what you think they are. They are created by humans. They're created by people. <clears throat> and so even at a young age, I realized that. And that's why I was going to <clears throat> different churches so I could learn, hopefully learn from, uh, you know, from older people and from uh, people who were teaching the theologies and religions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that's why I would go to the different churches uh, all, all the time with my young friends, <clears throat> hoping to learn and, and understand God, my life, and who I am, and why am I here, and where are we going. And uh, I, I became very, very distraught, very, very uh, disheartened, because everywhere I went, and all the different groups and different churches and synagogues and everywhere else I went, nobody ever took the time to explain anything simple to me because it was not, it was as if a simple things, simple questions that a child would have, uh, it's just mind boggling to adults because they've never thought on that level as a child. And so I would ask questions and the adults would look at me like I was a fool, like I had two heads. And so <clears throat> I realized that the adults are actually, and I knew this when I was nine and ten years old, I used to say this to my mom and dad, you know, adults are just grown-up children. I mean, I'll be an adult soon, and one day I'll be your age. But I'm just a child right now, so what's going to change? Nothing. Nothing's going to change. I don't know anything right now. I don't understand anything because I'm a child. And every time I ask adults that I go to churches and I ask them questions about God, they don't know either. So it became apparent to me by the ripe old age of 12, 13, 14 years old that adults are simply grown-up children. Their bodies have matured, but their brains are still at the 7th and 8th grade level. And so uh, I, I began to realize that if you're going to find out something, then do it yourself because you're not going to find it in a church. You're not going to find it in a religion because people who are in charge of the different churches don't know a thing about what it is they're doing. And, and it became apparent to me that churches and religions are nothing more than social arrangements, like the Cub Scouts and the ladies' clubs and the, uh, and the Masonic orders for the men and the women's clubs for women and, and the uh, Campfire Girls. It's these are all social groups where the different groups of, of humans can get together. You know, teenagers can get together and, or grown men, businessmen can get together. And so I realized that, that all the world is made up of associations where people get together of like mind, people who like a particular you know, uh, a philosophy or particular belief, they all hang out together, and people who belong to a particular church uh, or belong to a political party, they all hang out together. And so I just viewed coming up as a child that the religious philosophies and churches and synagogues and temples all around the world were nothing but social arrangements where people of like mind who collectively do not know <clears throat> what they're doing, they have no idea <clears throat> about what they believe, uh, they have no concept, conceptual reality, they have no concept of what they're talking about God, and they get all excited if you talk about God, 
but nobody knows what God is. I said God is dog, spell all backwards. And so I, I realized that the whole world is lying in ignorance everywhere I go. And then as I grew up, I grew older and began to lecture on these subjects that I was reading and studying 24 hours a day when everybody else was on skateboards and going to football games in school. I was in the, in the uh, libraries, university libraries, reading and studying history. Where did things come from? And, and the longer I did that, the more it became apparent to me that that's the way you learn. If you want to know, then do your own homework. Go out and spend weeks and months and years in university libraries. You don't have to go necessarily to a university for four or five, six years because that is a curriculum which is already decided for you to teach you what, what they want you to know so they will give you a, a permit to work. It's a working permit. They give you a license to go to work. I don't need a license to go to work. I'm trying to find out who I am and where did we come from and, worst of all, where are we going when we die because you get ready for it. You're going to leave this planet one day. And when you do, whatever it is you thought you believed, you're going to find out on the other side you didn't know what was going on. You had no idea about the history of this earth and the history of religions and concepts and ideas and belief systems. And so that's what I've been trying to do all my life is I've lived my life in libraries, university libraries, the big seminary libraries all over the country. Let, let me uh, let me interrupt you and ask you one of the relevant questions to exactly what you're talking about right now that was sent mm -hmm. in. Uh, first of all, they wanted to know if you were familiar with Manley P. Hall, and also have you ever been to the Philosophical Research Society Library in California, which apparently contains a whole lot of philosophical and uh, also religious uh, uh, artifacts, data, uh, manuscripts and books. Have you ever been there, and are you familiar with it? Manly P. Hall was not only a personal friend of mine that I used to go to his home, but when he passed away in his will, I was called uh, by um, Obadiah Harris, who was at that time the president and chairman of the board of the Manly P. Hall Philosophical Research Society. It's a big university in Los Angeles on Los Feliz Street. And I got a phone call. I was working at the Truth Seeker Company in San Diego. And, uh, and uh, Obadiah said, Jordan, Mr. Hall left a will and you are in it. Uh, and he has left you something <clears throat> very valuable and he wanted you to have it. And I said, Obadiah, what did he leave me? He said, I'm not going to tell you. You just come up here and you'll see it. So I immediately got in my car that day and drove up to Los Angeles from San Diego and went over because I've been to Mr. Hall's library uh, hundreds of times just over the years I've been there. and Used to go there on Sundays and hear Mr. Uh, Hall's lectures and talks. I was fascinated by the brilliance. This is what I've been looking for all my life. Somebody who had the answers. Somebody who knew what the words meant and broke down the etymology of the concepts of where these ideas have come from. Well, that was the tremendous work Mr. Hall had done. And so when I got there to find out what he had left me... <clears throat> In his will, Mr. Hall left me all of his research volumes. Uh, they were his research journals. And there was, there was I don't even know, maybe 100, 150 of them, uh, beautiful journals with all of his research in them. And going all the way back to 1936 to the, you know, to the day he passed. And he left it all no present to me and so that shocked me I was actually rather taken back I was shocked that such a phenomenal 
uh, 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 you know, a treasure, Mr. Hall would personally leave to me in his will. And so I not only knew Mr. Hall personally, I, I, I used to, as a matter of fact, just a, uh, a few months before he passed away, mm-hmm. I gave him an award. I was part of an organization called US of A, United Sensitives of America, and I was on the governing body of the of the organization, and it was a group, a large group of of different uh, what we call sensitives, uh, psychics, researchers, historians, numerologists, all kinds of interesting people. Some of them writers for television, etc., on esoteric and occult subjects. And I was on the I was on the board of directors with that organization. And so we had a big, oh, every year we would have a big fun, oh, we'd have, not, not a fundraiser, but we'd have a big award dinner where we would give awards to certain people who have done, um, you know, very big things for the human family, uh, teachers and lecturers and, and researchers, et cetera. And so uh, I suggested Mr. Hall, and we did, we did uh, give him an award, and he was there that night. And I was so absolutely delighted I was able to introduce Mr. Hall, my dear friend, and uh, not knowing that he was leaving me his his all his research journals and the will. But, uh, yes, I knew Mr. Hall, and he was an incredibly brilliant man. I do believe, and it's just my my personal belief, that Mr. Hall was probably one of the uh, uh, one of the most incredible spiritual minds that has ever visited our earth. This man uh, could speak for hours upon hours on all the intricacies of religion, theologies, concepts, and belief systems of where they came from and what they meant and how to understand them in relation to today's world. And he's, my God, he must have written 50 or 60 books and hundreds and hundreds of articles and, and given thousands of lectures quite literally around the world and through his own uh, college and university. Uh, the man was an astoundingly brilliant, uh, you know, in theories and understanding religions and government and historians. Uh, there's no one like him. There's never been anyone like him. Right. And we talk about the great philosophers of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and uh, and all of that. But as far as I'm concerned, there's nobody came close to Mr. Manley P. Hall, who was a brilliant and wonderful and dear man, and he was a dear friend of mine. And so uh, I, I'm just amazed that I even got to know him. But he was the answer a long time ago to I knew that there was information out there in the world and I wanted it so bad as the scripture says knock and it will be open and seek and you will find ask and it will be given well I was seeking and knocking and going to every church I could every group every every research society every uh, wherever I could go to hear our speakers explain to me the world I live in Nobody ever accomplished that. Nobody ever knew enough to tell me anything. So I was just wasting my young years going to churches where nobody knew what they were doing. Nobody had the faintest idea about what I'm talking about until I met Mr. Hall, who that's all he did was explain the world to you. Everything, where all the religions have come from, uh, where all the philosophies came from, what they meant, what the words meant, the etymology of the terms. Uh, it was such an extraordinary experience. And from there, that was in my uh, my 18, 19 year old. And then from there, I began to go deeply. Now that I have, uh, now that I know the basics, now I know what's going on here and I understand the lies and the deception that the world believes because they don't know this is why I feel like I said before if you go to a church today 
people will ask you, oh, are you a believer? Yes, I'm a believer. And so, oh, well, how long have you been a believer? And so they have books in, in, in church libraries and church bookstores called uh, uh, with the term believer in it. A lot of the books are called Believers, House of Faith, or Believers This or Believers That. It implies you believe something, which implies you don't know anything, but you believe something. I don't want to believe. I have been too often, too often, I have been misled. Why? Because I didn't know. And I thought that these people who were older than me, they have white and gray hair, and I assumed they were the teachers. Mm -hmm. I listened to them, and then I would ask them questions, and then they would look at me as a child like a deer in the headlights of a car. They had no idea what I'm talking about. Right. And so, therefore, like Albert Einstein said one time in one of his books, he said, the teachers used to tell us that we had to answer their questions. But I asked, how come you can't answer our questions? And that's what I felt. I have questions that the, that the teachers of religion couldn't answer. Why? Because they're too simple-minded. Just a child would think of them. And I would ask certain, I just ask a question and the priest would look at me like I'm a fool. I got three heads because he didn't know what the, he didn't know how to answer the question. I would ask my parents. I would ask people all around me, adults. Nobody seemed to know what they were doing. And so therefore I pretty much assumed that grown ups are just grown up in body, but in their minds, they're still children. They don't know anything. I want to know. I want to prove it. I want somebody to show me what it is that's happening and prove it to me so I can understand it correctly. And that you're not going to get in any church or any synagogue or any temple or any, uh, or any Islamic temple. You're not going to get that anywhere in the religious community of this world because the truth is not in religions. Right. There is no truth. In religion, it's a belief system. But once you get past that and wake up and now begin to mature, not just your body, but your mind, and begin to question things. And if you really want to know, and if you're intellectually honest and are ready to hear the real truth, it's out there. All you need to do <clears throat> is just go ask and it will be given. Knock and it will be open. Seek and you will find. Right. And what but, was really interesting about uh, about Mr. Hall is that he had, you know, people to point to the patronage he had, which was extremely helpful in collecting uh, the, the baseline of what he collected in that library for certain. Um, but <clears throat> the fact is this guy knew where to go, too. He traveled all over the world, even during the time of the Depression, when... The Depression was oh, worldwide. Yeah. It wasn't just in America. And he went and found some very unique things that are in that library. Uh, oh, did he ever. Yeah. It, was, it was enormous. <clears throat> His personal library, if you've ever been to the Philosophical Research Society, which is a university-type uh, school that Mr. Hall set up, <clears throat> and he had his own personal library, which was... A, a, a two-story two high uh, wa uh, walls and walls and walls of reference books from all over the world on every subject you can imagine. But that was the public side of his personal library. He allowed the public to see. But if you go behind the scenes, he had another library at PRS that nobody gets to see. And it was his personal library, which is, again, filled with walls of of massive volumes, and there was very, I couldn't think of a subject that asked him that he could not sit down for 90 minutes to two hours and explain it in minute detail and show you exactly where things have come from, exactly what the words meant in the ancient Roman Empire as opposed to the Babylonian Empire and what these words and terms and ideas and phrases that you hear today in religions where they actually came from and they don't mean what you thought they did. And boy, when I started waking up to the fact that, man, there has been a world of knowledge hidden from the human family. 
my God, how much that you don't know that you've never been told that is overwhelming and obvious when somebody <clears throat> finally shows it to you. They finally sit you down and say, are you ready to hear the real truth? Fine. Here's where it really came from. Here's what you're actually talking about. When you're talking about <clears throat> somebody being anointed and you call Jesus the anointed, do you know what anointed means, where it came from, the etymology of not only the word but the concept? It goes back to sex. It goes back to sexual connections between humans. It's called anointing. And then when you get into all of the different stories in the Old Testament, basically boils down to sex and drugs, alcohol, and business, and corporations, and, and laws. And my God, what, a, what an education it has been for me for the past 60 years of peering behind the veil of the darkness that we call world religions. Mm. It's an extraordinary story. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I want to blow add, your mind. I want to add in another question, which has something to do with behind the veil a bit. Um, <clears throat> now, I've cut this down from a much longer email to get to the core of the question. But <clears throat> they've asked a great deal about... Uh, about the uh, the reality behind you know Freemasons and the idea that uh, you know in order to join the Freemasons you have to believe in a higher power of some type and there's uh, a lot of dispute and discussion about this and all that and it's a very long they gave me like four or five paragraphs before yeah. they got to this question <laughs> and uh, they wanted to know really about Sirius the dog star now. Of course, I think back to just what you said a few minutes ago regarding how, uh, you know, the dog star and, well, God and dog, you just flip the words around and there you go. You got the same thing. But here's, uh, here's what the question is. At the highest levels of the Freemasons, uh, you know, what God do they worship? Because it appears as though from their research that, uh, it has something to do with the star Sirius. So that is what they're asking, and then there's a follow-up question that that uh, goes along with this, and I'll just give it I'll give it all to you at once, and you do with it as you like. Okay. Um, were Christianity and Judaism created by secret societies to control the poor, and is it uh, not simply mind control to keep the masses docile, effectively? <laughs> And uh, that this is tied together with this question about Sirius and the Dog Star in this very lengthy email, which um, I'm going to send you, by the way, since you sent me six, five, six paragraphs, I'm going to send you a membership. I'm not going to say who you are, but I'm going to send you a membership at my website just for taking the time to write out this treatise <laughs> where you yes. ask these questions. But, uh, yes. but I think you know what we're getting at here, and uh, I just throw it to you. Yes, well, uh, unfortunately... Uh, many, many thousands and thousands of years ago, mankind began searching the heavens for wisdom and knowledge. And like Mr. Hall said, they weren't looking to learn about. They were looking into the heavens to learn from the stars. They were looking at the stars and the, and the constellations and the, and the sun and the moon and trying to uh, figure out where did these things come from. And that was the beginnings, and then for thousands of years, mankind has only been a handful, not all of mankind. The overwhelming majority of mankind are still on skateboards and watching, uh, you know, watching beavers and butthead. But there has been always in the history of mankind, there have always been those who were born into this world to become geniuses. They become brilliant minds because they study. When everybody else is out drinking and partying, they are researching and studying into the late hours of night and the early mornings. They're in universities reading, studying, calculating, understanding the words, the terms, where things have come from. And they become our great teachers, of which 90% of the people will never hear anything about because nobody seems to care about that kind of wisdom and knowledge. And so I've, I realized that a long time ago, and boy do I realize it now, that I have spent my entire life 
studying in university libraries uh, on my own, just sitting and reading and reading and reading and cross-referencing and cross-pollinating uh, uh, ideas and concepts with something that was said you know, 5,000 years ago by the Babylonians. And now today we're saying the same identical thing, but we just don't know it. And so I, I've, I've decided that uh, the world of mankind is totally ill-informed and unread about the real history of the world that you live in. The history of this earth itself is staggering if you have the intellectual acumen to understand the, uh, the perimeters of our history. We, we have artifacts which are known to be handmade artifacts which are found in the earth in such a, de uh, in such a depth in the earth that all the paleontologists and archaeologists all agree that at that depth, that far down into the earth, the strata is at least three to three and a half billion, with a B, three and a half billion years old strata going way down into the earth, as furthest we can go. You're digging into the earth that's three and a half billion years old, and yet we're finding handmade artifacts, strange and profoundly brilliant stuff. We're bringing up all kinds of handmade uh, 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 metals and rings and jewelry, and, uh, and, and some of it having writings that we don't even relate to. And so it implies that there has been an intelligence, people or intelligent life. I don't know what they were three billion years ago, but somebody was here three billion years ago because the handmade artifacts are now on display, which were dug out of uh, uh, strata, which is three and a half billion years old. So try and wrap your head around that. Try and wrap your mind around that. That life on this earth, intelligent life, and I do mean extraordinarily intelligent life, has been on this earth for three and a half billion years ago. Three and a half billion years ago, there was highly intelligent creatures on this earth. I don't know if they look like us. But I do know that there, according to the science of today, we are now finding handmade artifacts in the oceans or beneath the oceans when they're drilling for oil. They hit the bottom of the ocean and they drill into the bottom. And they drill into the floor of the ocean, and as they're pumping it up, as the stuff comes up, they're finding handmade artifacts which are under the ocean floor. We have uh, pyramids the size of the Great Pyramid of Egypt on the Atlantic uh, on the Atlantic Ocean floor, ten miles north of the of the island of Bimini, in an area called the Bahama Banks, is an enormous pyramid sitting on the ocean floor. And how many people know that? And better still, how many people even care? You better care because there's something going on on this earth that we haven't been told. And the reason why is because the people who are given this knowledge and are, have know about it and who are looking at this kind of esoteric knowledge, it's a big club and you ain't in it. Right. And this is oh. what George Carlin was talking about when you find out how much you have not been told because you are masters who believe that they own you. They have, con they have actually framed mischief by law. They have actually created laws among themselves. And those laws that they created say that they own all the poor working class people of the world. They own your body and they put you on their stock market. Mm. And so the people who run this planet are not about to tell you nothing. They don't figure you're smart enough to understand it, and you're just getting in the way anyway because with your IQ, you wouldn't understand it anyway, and that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to crawl on your knees and pay your rent and go out and enjoy your beer and your pretzels and your, and your ball games and your 
football, your tennis ball games, and go out and play games with a ball and stay out of the way of the people who run this planet. Right. The Rockefellers don't care a damn about you or your family or the Rothschilds or any of the other international banking elite or the people who are the real powers behind the governments of this world. Don't ever think that the President of the United States is the most powerful man uh, in this country. He is not. He merely represents. He's a president of a company. He's not the owner of the company. Right. You better go back and find out where your country came from and who was running this planet behind your back that is, prefer that is keeping you ignorant, ill-informed, and unread so that they can easily manipulate you into doing whatever they want you to do. So you're only good for one thing. If they need you in a war, they need some warm bodies to send over in a war, good. War is good for business, so you need to invest your son. So I'm just saying that if you wake up and find out that the world you live in is not being created by the God you thought was around you and thought that you, you know, God loves you, and then you find out you don't even know what the word God means. Yeah. And when you look at this word, uh, Sirius, the dog star, uh, first of all, this is where we get our word sir. So in the military, and when I was growing up in the South, I always learned to, when talking to adults, with yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. Sir, S-I-R, comes from Sirius. So, therefore, the pharaohs of Egypt were said to have come from Sirius. Yes, sir, no, sir, military. And so there is a whole militaristic presence on the earth, which I have talked about before, where all the armies of the world always march the same. The goose step is the same with the Nazis or with all the other uh, countries of the world. All the nations of the world have armies, navies. They have, uh, they have the merchant marines. They all salute the same way. They all wear same insignias, insignias. They, all the militaries of the world operate the same behind the scenes. My God, you need to wake up and find out your world is run by people you have no idea in the world who really is the power of America behind the scenes. Just as we look at the Roman Empire, we see Caesar, and we hear about the great Caesars of Rome, never realizing the Caesars were not the boss in Rome. The money is the boss in Rome. Right. The people with the money decided what the Caesar will do and what he won't do. The bankers. And now you're talking about behind the Caesars of Rome. You're talking about Arius Copernicus Pisos. P-I-C-O-S. Look it up for a change and realize Caesar merely was on his knees to his monetary masters, the Pisos people and the Flavians. And when you begin to see the, the real powers behind the Roman Empire were banking, demonic, depravity banking families. And they, they control the Roman people through religion, Alcohol, drugs, sex, international uh, competitions of games. And my God, when you understand how this earth is actually run and who owns it and how they control it and then how your government works. And you got two, you got two parties, Democrats and Republicans in America, and we call them left wing and right wing. Why do we call the two parties left wing and right wing? That's because a, uh, uh, an eagle only has two wings. That's why the American eagle, the ball eagles on the American $1 bill. If you look on the back of a $1 bill, you'll see an eagle with two wings, left wing and right wing. And you will see he has nine tail feathers, which is the council of nine. Most people have never heard of the Council of Nine, but you better go back and start doing some homework and find out the secret societies that founded this country and that financed this, this country's wars throughout the world and who they really are and what you are doing here. Because you don't know from a, you have no idea in the world 
where this world has come from, where it is now, and get ready because it's going to go where it was already designed to go. Mm. So, so it's an incredible story of betrayal of the human family. Oh, absolutely. And look, there's just a couple other questions here. Uh, two more that I want to dispose of. Uh, it's, it's fascinating though. The Bimini Road is something that is not really focused upon in many presentations. I, I know very little about it. Uh, but what but was the term again? The, the Bimini Road. You know, you were talking oh, yes. about okay. Bimini, okay. and uh, so I only yep. know about that structure that you know comes out, looks like a harbor underwater, and all that. Uh, yep. I, I got to be honest with you, I'm kind of ignorant on that subject. But it is fascinating to me because I've studied a lot of Roman history. <clears throat> yep. Now, when they talk about the different emperors and Julius Caesar himself, uh, any of these people, you take a look at them raising armies. And there's never any mention by mainstream historians who funds these things. These things didn't happen for free. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't produce the, the you know, when, when you take a look at the phalanx that the, uh, that the Romans used, you had to manufacture shields. You had to manufacture these short stabbing swords they used, uh, in order to use the Roman phalanx in battle. You know, that costs money. <laughs> All right, but but you of notice of course it did. The, where did they get that money? And that's the same thing with Adolf Hitler. The, Germany was broke after the First World War was over. Germany was actually broke, and 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 it was said by the historians that every day, every afternoon, <clears throat> horse-drawn carriages would ride through the major cities of Germany and pick up the dead bodies on the streets that had just actually starved to death and laid down and died on the street on the street corners because they were broke there was no money food right. was uh, had no food and people were dying uh, and so the the horse drawn carriages would go through the cities of Germany and pick up all the dead bodies who had died that day and then out of that incredible, horrible situation of a, of a massive country like Germany being totally broke and starving, Adolf Hitler comes into power out of nowhere in 1920s, late 1920s. He comes into power and starts ranting and raving about, you know, this is, we should put an end to this terrible tragedy. And then all of a sudden he's been running for uh, the, he's being run for the chancellor. Ship, and then he becomes chancellor, and all of a sudden, he's building the greatest standing military machine the world has ever seen. Adolf Hitler built the the greatest navy, the greatest standing army, the most well-fed, well-clothed, and well-army military industrial complex on the face of the earth. And mm -hmm. nobody seems to have ever asked a silly, childish question: Where did he get the money? Well, right. Uh, the funny thing is that a mainstream historian will try and explain to you that it was Fritz Tyson who funded the, the Third Reich's uh, military machine. Problem is that the machine that Hitler built cost way more than Fritz Tyson had. <laughs> Um, no, I'm serious. On. Mathematically, uh, it's impossible for Fritz Tyson to have funded uh, what would have been necessary to do all the things that Hitler did. It's, it's well, I mean, not there. we say that Wall Street. Wall Street is a classic example. Wall Street did this, and Wall Street did that, and Wall Street funded this and that. But when you talk about Wall Street, you're not talking about Wall Street. You're talking about a lot of guys that work on Wall Street. Right. You're talking about a lot of names, a lot of big names in banking and insurance companies and maritime admiralty shipping companies and big big institutions and large corporations, not just one man. No, we're talking a Wall Street, a whole conglomerate of powerful people who are together. They are wealthy and they're going to stay wealthy. And the way they all stay wealthy is they protect each other, mm. like lawyers protect each other, cops protect each other, doctors protect each other, you know, and it's the poor people in the street. We don't protect nothing. We're just the saps that pay for everything. So well, when you, you find out that yeah. the, the, the Adolf Hitler financed the whole uh, Second World War, he financed the restoring of the Nazi empire and almost took over the world doing it. He was so powerful he could go into Russia, set up the war with the United States, England, Europe, Russia, and go into Africa, and the Nazis were all over the earth 
doing all kinds of things. Where did he get the money? Right. You know, I actually, I, I would like to ask a question, Jordan, since since we're talking about the Third Reich, and I want to link it back to the subject matter for tonight. Um, I, I still have two questions from listeners, by the way, <laughs> but okay. I want to throw one of my own in, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I've, I've seen these very vague studies about the mystical aspects, the esoteric aspects of the SS. During yep. that time, there is a whole order, it appears, but the, the, the records are incomplete from what I know. I mean, I'm sure that there's lots of stuff that's captured and probably uh, still classified, you know, that, but we can't see it uh, as the public. We captured a lot of archives <clears throat> when the Third Reich fell. Uh, if you don't believe me, the guy who had access to three buildings worth of it wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, literally launching the entire genre of what we call modern contemporary history and literature. But, you know, the reality is that uh, most of the public has never seen the, these other weird aspects to the SS. It's not simply adherence to the leader. There was a, a, a mystical, I, I want to call it mystical, I want to call it esoteric, I want to call it a cult. And I think all three of these things qualify uh, aspect to the SS, which is not all of uh, the German army, which is not all of Germany, but uh, seem to be a, a, a kind of a club, if you will. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I've never really heard too much about that, except to see that there's some evidence on it. Um, does that link to any of what it is we've talked about so far? So far, it's exactly what I'm talking about, precisely, uh -huh. <laughs> because because the SS SS was just one part of a far bigger bigger picture. Uh, the the best minds today on the earth there's there's quite a few brilliant people out there that I have an extraordinarily uh, high respect for. Their minds, they're brilliant people who have really done their homework. Anthony Sutton was probably the first one I would name, Anthony Sutton. I think he is no longer with us. But he has written so many books on the esoteric, hidden world of finance that the Nazis enjoyed. Mm -hmm. All of the mystical, dark stuff of where they got their money from and why all the U.S. banks, big banks like the uh, Manhattan, the big banks like Rockefeller's Bank, and uh, I, what about trying to say the Philadelphia Bank of um, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Guaranteed Trust, uh, the Rockefeller Bank, City Bank in Chicago, uh, the Commercial Bank in Georgia, and some of the biggest, actually the largest uh, uh, industrial complexes like General Electric, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, Eli Lilly Glass. Standard Oil, Union Oil, all of these big corporations, big banks, big industries, both in England and America, were all being financed and in, in sending money and materials to Germany. Coca-Cola, uh, all the different drink companies, the food companies, General Mills, General Electric, General <laughs> uh, Motors, uh, Ford Motor Company were all supplying hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars plus all of their equipment that they were producing here in America was being shipped directly to Germany to finance and supply Adolf Hitler for his war. But nobody seems to realize, you know, you're talking about high crimes and treason. Mm -hmm. You're talking about high crimes and treason where American corporations, big business, banking institutions, secret societies, fraternal orders were all behind Adolf Hitler, sending him money, sending him and the newspapers like the New York Times and the L.A. Times. All these big newspapers were, were, were working directly with Adolf Hitler. I mean, they even have a, a property out here in Southern California where Hitler was going to live once he took over the world. He was going to live and take and run the world from Los Angeles. And he has a big home that was here being built for him by the international bankers in, in, in New York and Chicago and San Francisco, Bank of America, the Giannini Banks, 
it's an incredible story of the real truth of the of the world you live in. Anthony Sutton, look up his name, Anthony Sutton, and get his books. Also, living today, a two brilliant minds on the same subject you'll need to know about is Joseph Farrell, F-A-R-R-E-L-L, Joseph Farrell. Right. Nobody comes near him today. <clears throat> and, of course, there is Peter Lavenda, L-E-V-E-N-D-A, Peter Lavenda, Joseph Farrell, and Anthony Sutton. All three of these are monstrous, brilliant men who have explained the whole Second World War was financed, organized, and directed out of New York City. Absolutely. New York, the Empire State. Well, right, and even we, we know publicly that uh, people like Prescott Bush and other members of the uh, board at, uh, <laughs> you know, the First Bank of New York were all called on the carpet for trading with the enemy. That's right. During World War II, this is this is the truth. Yeah, that would be the grandfather of uh, George H. W. Bush, or excuse me, the father of George H. W. Bush, the grandfather of George W. Bush. Yep. Uh, certainly, he was caught up in it. But the truth is that uh, a lot of that is all American. It's really American made. Even the and eugenics programs, uh the concepts of eugenics. <clears throat> yeah, really it was American all, born. eugenics was the eugenics, the getting rid of the the lower class of people for the new world order, uh and all of that eugenics idea, that Nazism idea was given birth to, not in Germany, not by by Hitler at all. No. That whole idea was developed for New world order, a whole new race of, of people, eugenics that would have a blonde hair, blue eyed, a master race. That was all dreamt up on Laurel Canyon in Studio City in Los Angeles, up on Laurel Canyon, Mulholland Drive. There was a whole cadre of, of Nazis, brilliant German theoreticians who lived up in the hills, what we call the Hollywood Hills, go up Laurel Canyon till you hit, uh, uh, you hit Mulholland. You can take left or right, and there's all kinds of secret, brilliant people living up there, and they were there back in the 20s and 30s, living in the hills of Los Angeles, developing right. an idea for taking over the world out of Los Angeles, Studio City, and it was called, and it was referred to as Nazism. And boy, when you find out who was financing the Nazi philosophies and ideas, and how it's connected to the different religions of today, it's an incredible story that you'd have to take about 50 years of your life and sit and just read and study everything so that your mind can be wrapped around the real truth of the world you live in. Right. Now, believe it or not, we've gone through the first hour here with Jordan Maxwell, and I've just really asked questions uh, that have either been posed in the chat room or have been emailed to me or whatever. You can uh, drop more in there if you like, but I've got two left from you guys. We're going to take <laughs> a break really quick, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get to everything that uh, that we have time for, and if not, well, this series will continue, I guess. This particular uh, episode seven will be focused more or less on answering people's questions. And uh, by the way, some people have dropped some links in the chat room to uh, some of the individuals that have been discussed here and uh, some relevant stuff. One of the authors Jordan mentioned, there's a, it looks like a Wikipedia page. A few other things are on there. Um, and, and you can also go in there and share information with others who are listening to the show, either live or later on. It doesn't matter. Uh, I will collect questions and always ask Jordan. We won't necessarily devote another whole episode to it, but looks like that might be what we're going to do tonight, Jordan, if that's okay with you. That's okay with me. Uh, but but I enjoy this because, you know, all of these things are linked together. See, somebody might say, why are they discussing the Third Reich on a religion special? Well, <laughs> because the Third Reich was a religion. There you go. And, you know, you, you can look to previous episodes where Jordan was discussing the German people and Judaism. And, hey, how about their symbol, the swastika? Well, <laughs> Interesting. Again, go back and listen to the earlier episodes. You'll find out a lot of interesting stuff there. But we are late going to the break, Jordan. 
So second hour of the Ocelli I Effect begins now, now. Just a little late here at Ocelli.com. Do appreciate you for tuning in on to this part seven uh, with Jordan Maxwell on religion. What we're doing is answering the questions from listeners tonight. But, uh, you know, keep in mind, you can always go over to jordanmaxwellshow.com, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Here's a couple things you can do over there besides joining the Research Society. Uh, there's a donate button there, and Jordan can at all times. I mean, you guys are writing to me and telling me that Jordan is a treasure. Jordan's a great man. Well, you know what? He could always use some a positive feedback from you at his email address by contacting him or a touch of appreciation via a donation, if you wish. And, of course, obviously we don't ask anybody to donate to anything unless they can afford to do so. Uh, but the fact is that uh, people that are giving you the truth are not being paid very well for it. See, they, they, they pay people a lot of money to lie to you, actually. That's that's how the game works. But we all know this if we're tuned into my show for sure. JordanMaxwellShow.com is the website to go to. The donate button is there. The contact form is there. And also the Research Society, which, by the way, you can get a lifetime membership for for not too much money. I think it's about 30 bucks, actually. Uh, Jordan would appreciate any and all of those things happening. So... Just uh, figure I'll say it for him so he doesn't have to say it. JordanMaxwellShow.com. And uh, like I said, donate, join the society, email Jordan. Tell him what a treasure he is because uh, you guys are telling me. All right. <laughs> you know, And I appreciate it. Believe me, I appreciate the feedback, but you, you, drop, drop Jordan the line. Okay, anyway. All of that having been said, Jordan, I'm really glad to do this with you tonight. And, yeah, we're not going to get into a deep discussion because we've got less than an hour left. But it is certainly worthwhile to cover the feedback and the questions that have come in. So here's this one, which is exactly as it is written. Okay, if you don't mind. And, uh, you know, bear with me here. Let's see. i got to pull it back up. Um Exactly as it's written. All right. How did the Roman Empire historically transition to today's Vatican? There's a question mark then. Is there a timeline from the Old Testament to the New Testament uh, to 325 A.D.? Question mark. Okay. I, I, I don't fully understand the second question. Um, but I do. Okay. Yeah. Good enough. Well, three, as long as you do, it works. Yeah, well, 325 A.D. was the official year of the founding of the Roman Catholic Church. 325 ah. A.D. is when the Vatican uh, and the powers that be of Europe uh, that was still under the Roman law, still under the Rome, but Rome had fallen back in the 5th century. And so for a while there was nothing but chaos in Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. But about 325 A.D. was the official founding of the Roman Catholic Church and the founding of the Vatican as the center for the worship of the Roman Catholic Church. And so all the, the Roman Catholic Church was was just picking up the pieces from behind the scenes by the international banking cartels who owned and ran the, the Roman Empire. As I said, Caesar didn't run anything. Caesar merely represented the government of Rome. And he was like the, uh, he was the, he wanted to make himself emperor of Rome. Well, that didn't work. And so, uh, uh, but the people who were financing the Roman Empire behind the scenes, uh, that was a couple of different families. Like today we have, in our world today, in Europe, we have the Rothschilds, and in America, we have the Rockefellers. And so, you know, governments, the big governments of the of the United States and of Europe, they don't do anything unless they check with the boss first to see if, if that's all right to do. Whatever it is they're going to do, you better check with the people who have the money, the bankers. Because you, know, you want to do this, you want to go into Vietnam and fight a war, or you want to go here, you want to go there. Well, the only place you're going is where the bankers need you to go. If there is something that the Rockefellers need and they want done because of their corporations and their world 
class strategy for controlling the, the, the whole damn earth. They need for certain countries to be wiped out. They need for certain areas to be taken over. They need for certain governments to be overthrown. And so they will let you know as the president what you're going to do for them. And if you're going to do it for them, they are the boss, not you. And they have their own people who are going to strategize the war and the overthrow of the countries that you're going to overthrow and so, you know, we see the, the Bushes uh, championing the idea that we're going into Iraq and we're going to do this and we're going to do that in Iraq with, our, uh, with all of our uh, people, all of our different countries are going to join together. No, no, no. You will do what your banking uh, partners behind the scenes are telling you to do. Bush didn't want to go into the Middle East. The banks wanted to go into the Middle East. Right. And it has to do with the oil and also the occult or hidden stuff in the Middle East that you don't know anything about. But the international cartels, they do know the stuff that's in the Middle East that you don't know is even there. And they want that stuff. They want it from the ancient Roman Empire, from the ancient Babylonian in Sumerian Empire. They want it from all the different ancient uh, you know, empires that have been hiding stuff, hiding their gold, hiding their technology, hiding all kinds of things in the Middle East for many, many centuries. And the international cartels that run this world, they know that. So they want certain countries overthrown so they can go in and do what they want and plunder and find all the different things that they know is in those countries, but they can't get into them right now unless you overthrow the government. And so all of a sudden we now have a, have a war in the Middle East. Why? Because we, you know, because they're evildoers? No, because the banking fraternities want something in Iraq and the Iraqis are not interested in giving it to them. And they're not interested in telling them where to find what they're looking for in Iraq. So the international banking cartels out of out of uh, England, out of New York, they get together. And they decide we're going to go into Iraq and take what we want. We're not going to ask them nothing. We'll send in our, uh, our, our Marines and our military machine and rip them off and take everything and take it all. And mm -hmm. anybody gets your way, kill them all. Why? Because what we want out of those countries is so important, we don't give a damn how many people have to die. Just go in and get it, period. Mm. And if you can't do it, we'll have you assassinated and put somebody else who can do it. And so that's the bottom line on how the world works. It's all nothing but a business, period. It's a business and a corporation. And what we're talking about in a world war is a hostile corporation. Big companies, big banks taking over smaller countries and smaller banks. Right. It's just a business, and the mafia will tell you that. So no, all, that's the all way true. the world works. All true, but what's interesting to me is is the next question, which is kind of an odd one, but uh, look, I'm going to ask them as they're written. Um, it seems as though it's a lot of uh, white people problems. This is a quote from the, from the listener. And uh, where are the Asians in this? Uh, the Chinese, Japanese, and in fact, most of Asia are not even mentioned, despite the fact that they had empires and they had esoteric aspects to their culture. Uh, why has that not been part of the discussion so far in six episodes? This is the question from the listener. I think that is a very, a very interesting question, and and, and it's true. Uh, the points that he's making that there are some incredibly ancient and very powerful uh, empires that have uh, existed in the in the uh, so-called uh, uh, Asian world, and uh, and some of it has bled over into the Western world, and, and great wars have been fought because of this. Um, again, I would go back to, because I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything, and I've said that so many times, but if you go back and listen to and go on the web to uh, YouTube and listen to Joseph Farrell, F-A-R-R-E-L-L, -L, Joseph Farrell, 
is an extraordinary, brilliant mind talking about those ancient cultures and their empires and how they impact the world events today. And uh, and and Peter Lavenda, L E V E N D A, Peter Lavenda also another extraordinary mind talking about that very subject about the ancient peoples of the of the east and their empires and how they impacted and caused uh the the western empires the white man so to speak uh to do what we're doing to do what they what they're doing today with the earth so that's a very dark question very very deep and i don't think we have time to get into to all of it right now, but uh, but it is a very good question, yeah, and there are some answers about it. There are some answers. No, certainly, and I I, I think it's worthy of discussion and also a piece of rare uh, discourse because nobody really talks about it. <laughs> yep, there's very well, few Joseph people. Joseph Farrell does. Boy, get him, get him started on this subject, and he'll talk for hours about things you've never heard about the Orient. You know, I've been meaning the, to get him on this show too. Actually, oh, Joseph he's Farrell. sensational. Uh, but P- no. Peter Lavinda is an interesting guy, too, because th- th- this is one of the more open-minded people that takes a look at this stuff. Uh, sometimes he goes in some pretty odd directions, but uh, but quite honestly, he's uncovered a lot of different, uh, very, very seemingly insignificant religious orders and uh, groups of individuals that are brought together for esoteric purposes. Matter of fact, I think uh, I learned about the Council of Nine through him. That's um, right. If, I, know, if I, I think back, I'm, yeah. I I know Peter Levinda and I've met him, and 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 Joseph and I, Joseph Farrell and I talk on many occasions. I will call him, or he'll call me, and we try and maybe connect at least once a month and chat for a few minutes about the latest stuff that he's working on. Uh, mm-hmm. I just think uh, it's an extraordinary uh, well of information, Peter Levinda and Joseph Farrell. Uh, I, I I just I, I don't have words to express mm-hmm. my admiration for both of those guys because they are both extraordinarily wise and brilliant people. So right. the world we live in is very very strange. And well, you know, part well, of the problem with this with this access to the knowledge about Asia, truthfully, is is because of the language barrier. Yeah, uh, of course. In, in a linguistic sense. It is near impossible to make direct translations between. I mean, you can translate one from the other, but you can't do it with a you know, no, with a I handbook. Know. Yeah. Uh, no. it, it is something that can be done. I mean, James Corbett is is a guy who can speak both Japanese and English quite well, but uh, but the fact is that th- this is not. Uh, it's not like learning Spanish, Jordan. It's not like learning German. Uh, you know, because there are certain aspects to the language. Which uh, which make it a bit prohibitive for a lot of I people understand. to understand it. So I think that's part of the problem. But uh, there are people who study it, and you bring up two two very interesting names. So yep. last question. Not sure where this one's going to go, but uh, this is probably the oddest of all the questions. Um, you've heard of now that there's a, there's a whole thing here about the about what they they refer to quite often as the Devil's Bible. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And I'm sure you've heard of it, Jordan. Uh, yep, I've heard of it. Uh, and and I've always been fascinated by this thing, to be honest with you, because to my knowledge, no one has a- adequately translated any of it. It is a uh, like one of these giant sized books. It's not the only giant book in the world that's like an oversized volume. Um, yeah. There are a handful of these things. Most people have never heard of this, by the way. These giant books that are out there, but uh, there's a whole. Um, story behind its creation i'm not so sure about that if it's been vetted verified understood but uh basically the listener wants to know if you believe that at some point uh other knowledge which has already been out there in uh let me read the question exactly here sorry okay have other scriptures given us the knowledge but not yet the time to unlock secrets like the devil's bible and in general what are jordan's thoughts on the devil's bible is it a uh, a, a dark uh, artifact or a or a mystical thing which is uh, not quite meant to be understood just yet but will be in the future well, first of all, the devil, the very word devil, as I've said before, is the word evil, E-V-I-L, evil, and put a D in front of the word evil, it becomes devil. 
and so or take a an o out of the word good and it becomes god so god is good and the devil's evil but uh so it's just words but when it comes to the devil's bible i've had a copy of it in my hand uh, on occasions over the years but i never really looked at it i wasn't interested in that at the time that i had it in my hand I could probably get a copy of it pretty fast if I wanted it. But I really haven't looked at the Devil's Bible as such because there are other you know, volumes out there, really similar kind of things that I, I haven't spent much time even looking at. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting idea, and I might decide to look into it a little further. But as of the moment, I really don't know much about what is actually written in what we call the Devil's Bible. But uh, outside of that, yes, I do believe that there are other scriptures, especially in the Hindu and in the uh, and in the northern India, uh, in the mountains of Tibet. I am totally sure that there are scriptures out there by the thousands that have not been translated yet, that are astoundingly incredible stuff. That will blow your mind if you knew what was out there in those in, in those monasteries in what we call Tibet. There are thousands of manuscripts that are being translated today, little by little, slowly but surely. And the and the things which are said in those manuscripts go back uh, just God knows how many thousands of years ago. But somebody knew what was really going on in the universe, in the whole entire universe, not just our Milky Way galaxy, but in the whole of, of, the, of the subject of where life has come from, who controls the, the, the living entities of this uh, universe that we live in. Somebody has known this for a long time, and they wrote many, many thousands of years ago in scriptures that we today are just now beginning to penetrate and find incredible knowledge that we didn't know existed before. And so that, I'm sure, is going to change the whole complexion of the whole human family in the years to come. As we begin to, uh, you know, look at those scriptures and begin to, for the first time to read them and understand what they're saying to us, because they're, some of them are ten thousand years old, but beautifully written. If you see the handwriting and the incredible handwriting of these scriptures, and and where they've come from and how old they really are and what they're talking about, it's a mind trip just looking at ancient scriptures. So. The Bible is not the only scripture that you need to know about. There's a lot more out there that we're not being told about. And the reason why, as I said to you before, George Carlin said it best, that the people who are collecting this knowledge, who know about it, who study it, who are, who are experts on it, it's a big club and you're not in it. So they, the people who run this planet, assume that you're not smart enough to deal with this kind of knowledge and they don't want you getting in their way. You 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 know, you just go out and watch your silly basketball games and all your silly childish little ball games that you children love to play. And you know, that's what and I said that before. Animals love to play with balls. Give a cat or a dog a ball, <clears throat> they'll play with it all day long and they get all the other cats in the neighborhood and they're all playing ball. And so that's what the, our masters who own us, the people who think that they own the planet, they see us as just a bunch of animals, and so they give us ball games. They give us all kinds of ball games. I don't know of any sport today in the Western world that isn't based on a ball, from golf to pool and bowling ball and football and basketball and tennis ball and soccer ball and, God knows, pinball <laughs> And so it's all based on a ball. Why? Because they want you to go play with a ball. You know, like like I told you many years ago, when my dad, and my my family, my 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 mom and my dad would have families coming over for 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 you know for dinner or whatever, come to visit, and after dinner, the women would all end up out in the in the back porch or in the kitchen, talking, and the men would all go in the front room. And my dad would always say, you kids go out and play. So all of the kids 
uh, you know, we would to go out and play ball. Go out and play ball. And I told my dad a couple of times, I don't want to go play ball. I want to know what you guys are talking about. Because I know you think I'm stupid, but I'm not stupid. And I know that you want me out there playing ball because you want to talk about something that you don't figure I need to hear. <laughs> but I got news for you. I'm not stupid. I want to hear what you guys are really talking about. And uh, since it, it doesn't have anything to do, my curiosity has got nothing to do with my, what my mom's talking to her girlfriends about. I want to know what you guys are talking about because that's what I am too. Oh, I, and so I, I realized a long yeah. time ago they don't want you knowing. They don't, people in this world don't want you to know what's really going on. So that that you have to get yourself, and that's what I'm trying to help you do. Right. I'll tell you where to go and where, it, and I'll show you who to go to. On my research website, as you know, I have different uh, departments in that research website. One of them is important people and links. Mm. And that's very special to me, that important people and links uh, 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 part of my research website. Because I have, over the years, I have met the people's like Manly P. Hall and the Joseph Farrells and Peter Lavendas and all of these other incredible minds, brilliant minds that are doing and writing <clears throat> and educating their fellow man on things which most people don't even know exist. And so I put them all together on my research website and tell you about them, who they are, and go to their, go on the YouTube and type in their name and listen to these incredible people, what they're telling you. Mm. And so it's called uh, Important Links in People. And I know all of these people personally, and I ask, and I'm just showing you, if you want to know what's really going on in this world, yeah, then get my uh, research website and go through it methodically, and you'll find stuff there you didn't even know existed. So well, that's what I do. That's what I'm trying to do is educate my my fellow man. Right, and there's more being added there all the time. There is literally terabytes of information waiting to be uploaded to the site. But uh, you know, the webmaster goes as quick as he can. You can easily join that uh, by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com, and there's a button there for the Research Society website, and you can get into it. And and again, the, the subject of religion in and of itself is like one little section. And I don't yeah. mean little section in that there's not much in it. I mean it's one little section in comparison to the rest of what's happening there. Uh, yep. A lot of images, a lot of information, a lot of, you know, references to give you an idea of where to look for the information. But again, jordanmaxwellshow.com, that's where you start. That's the only website that is Jordan's. And uh, like we said at the beginning of this hour, um, <clears throat> you know, look, email Jordan. Throw a couple of bucks in for a donation. <laughs> These things are also helpful. Uh, you know, but, but obviously you can, uh, send him those messages about, uh, exactly how, uh, wonderful it is to hear from him and all that. I'm sure that Jordan would be more than happy to see them and probably write back to a lot of you if you send him emails. Yeah, because, okay. because uh, if you just go on my, as you said, my jordanmaxwellshow.com, <clears throat> but email me because uh, I live by myself in one room. Uh, that, uh, that I, 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 that's the way I live, with one room with nothing. I, I don't have a big income. A lot of people think you're a big star big because you're known, so therefore it means you're very wealthy. Well, I don't own anything. I have no bank account, no credit cards, nothing. I live on donations in one little room by myself, and I wouldn't even have this room if it wasn't for my friend who gave it to me. So I would have a place to live. I have nothing and own nothing and got nothing. And I live on donations. And so I'm, I'm always happy as an old man to see emails from around the world from people who hear me. And I appreciate what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do and, and want to help me with a donation because uh, it, it's very lonely at, uh, in the world that I live in because most people – that I, you know, around me don't like what I'm doing. They don't want to hear me. They don't want to hear that their world is not what they thought it was. And so I'm trying to do something uh, on my own and by myself in the last years of my life, on my own and by myself in one room. So I love hearing from people <clears throat> who care about me 
and it wouldn't hurt if I got a donation because I live uh, just on donations. So right. thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about that. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, we got one other question in the, as we were talking, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. and it relates to uh, to Manly P. Hall and, uh, and and a couple other things. Um, I'm thinking I, I know I know why they're asking this question, but anyway, I'll just uh, g- give you the uh, the crux of it, if you will. Um, yep. They talked about Manly P. Hall and that he had uh, they, they asked if he had actually been an advisor to more than one president. I'm aware that uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, I believe, had uh, had actually taken Manly P. Hall's counsel, um, I want to say, in the 1930s, mm-hmm. uh, when he was still kind of a young guy and everything. I mean, I think he was like in his 20s at that time yep. mm-hmm. um, when, uh, when, when Roosevelt had uh, not only been supportive of him, but had also uh, encouraged him and encouraged people to, uh, to listen. To what yeah, well, P. Hall had to why say. is because the president of the United States at that time was a lot of things, but stupid wasn't one of them. At that time, and right. he knew what I know. He knew that Manly Palmer Hall was a profoundly important spiritual presence on the earth. This man did not advocate any particular religion, did not promote any particular philosophy was not affiliated with any particular group at all. He was a man of wisdom that had studied the world, period. All of the different religions of the world he was an expert on. And today, he's even accepted today as one of the world's foremost experts on all the religions and cults and secret societies and all the esoteric theology of the world. This man was an expert's expert a teacher of the teachers, and he was my dear friend, and, and, and I spent many hours with him, and it was a wonderful experience being in the presence of an absolutely brilliant teacher, mm-hmm. and, uh, and so I learned many things from him, but I, I learned because I wanted to know, and that's why anyone who really wants to know, the Bible says, knock and it will be open, seek and you will find. Ask and it will be given. Right. And then the scripture says, my people are dying from a lack of knowledge. So I'm trying at my 78 year old, at 78 years old, I know I'm not going to be here much longer. Uh, and believe me, that doesn't bother me at all. I think I will be happy to leave. I've lived a very difficult life all of my life, fighting against the the system to try and educate both myself, my family, and the world around me. And so at this late date now in my life, I'm just trying to stay alive and do the best I can uh, to help my fellow man wake up because it's a wake-up time. The world we're living in is moving fast and furious toward some terrible catastrophe which is going to ultimately happen on the earth. And we we know about the great catastrophes in the ancient world, the great flood of Noah's day in the Bible, and the great, uh, you know, all of the great collapses of civilizations and all the horrible things that have happened on the earth. Uh, You know, one of them was the uh, when Mars and the earth came too close to each other and there was an electrical shock which caused which caused the uh, the uh, what do you call it that canyon the uh, Grand Canyon. Mm. You know, people don't know that about the Grand Canyon and why it was why we have a Grand Canyon. Most people don't know that the the only reason we have rain is because of media rights. Did you know that the only reason you have rain is because of media rights? If you didn't have media rights, you wouldn't have rain. So, so many people just do not know how the world we live in works. I have been in the, in the company of all kinds of strange and wonderful, brilliant people who are scientists, philosophers, uh, you know, astronomers, uh, astronauts, uh, all kinds of people from the very highest to the very lowest. I've been in the company of extraordinarily 
bad people, very brilliant people. I've heard all the stories from all corners of the world. And there's a lot of things I can never tell you that I would love to have the world of mankind know before I leave the world. But the, you know, I, I, some of the things I could say to you would be uh, uh, appalling to you, but it would also probably get me uh, killed and, and the people I would tell you about, uh, that would get them in trouble too. So there are certain things I can't tell you about the world you live in. I wish I could because I could tell you some things that would turn your hair white. Well, I got to tell you, I, I really appreciate the fact that you uh, take the time to sit down with me and do this, uh, you know, considering all of the uh, very interesting, strange and wonderful people that you've encountered in your life. Uh, it is uh, it's actually an honor for me to do this with you. So I just want you to know that, first of all. Second of all, you know, we, we could always record some of that stuff and then uh, release it afterwards. And, you know, they can't kill you if you're already dead. That's um, true. You know, there's there's something there, and I I don't I don't choose to live in fear, regardless of what would happen to me. Uh, you know, if I'm releasing that information and that has some repercussion, I, I just make that offer to you. That's all, no pressure. But let well, me uh, let me finish the question though, because yeah, okay. you know okay. they they started with Manly P. Hall, and then they went into a different direction here, and they wanted to know about the fact that there are many five pointed stars in America. Uh, that are representative of authority and various uh, uh, emblems in the country, but also the stars in places like the UK in a lot of cases have different numbers of points. Is there a significance to it, and does any of it tie to the order of the silver star? I know that's a well, really kind of a strange question, but uh, uh, some of that makes a lot of sense to me. There are certainly five-pointed stars on the American flag. You see our policy enforcer people they wear five pointed stars uh i know if you point one of those points down that's allegedly the evil side of things and you point one point up it's allegedly not and even among freemasons there's a bit of a debate about this <laughs> but um i don't see it yeah, as a and negative and symbol on the american on the american dollar bill on the back of the one dollar bill mm -hmm. you will see on the right hand side of the back side uh, you will see an eagle with his uh, two wings, and above the eagle are 13 stars, but the 13 stars together, all 13 together, uh, uh, they create what we call the Star of David. But very few people have ever wondered, why is the Star of David on the presidential seal of the United States when we know that the Star of David was not called the Star of David. The Star of David today in religion, the, the Jewish people and, the, and all the other people who have no idea about any of it, they just listen and think they're listening to somebody who knows what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so you'll hear the Jews talking about the Star of David. Well, first of all, there was no King David to start with in history, period. End of sentence. There was no King David. Period. There was no ancient Israel. Period. So all of the stuff you've been taught about in churches about ancient Israel and God's holy people never existed. Period. Now, what about the star of David? Well, if there was no David, then what is that star of David all about? In the Bible, it's called the star of Saturn. In the, in the reference works, if you go to encyclopedias and do some homework and go to an encyclopedia in a, in a uh, library and you will see the star that we call the Star of David is a six-pointed star. Right. It's a triangle and two triangles interlaced, one triangle pointing one way and one triangle pointing down, and the triangles, two triangles, make six points. And it's called the six-pointed star or the star of David. No, it's the star of Saturn. Saturn, the star, the, the, the planet with the rings. Go back in, into the encyclopedia and look up star of Saturn. And then you will find, oh, the star of Saturn is a six-pointed uh, star. Well, six in Latin is, uh, is called a, um, a hexagram. A hex is six. And so, therefore, today we have a hexagram on the on the American dollar bill above the eagle's head, 
on the back of the dollar bill, and it's a six-pointed star where it's com it's made up of 13 stars. And why 13? Because they were the 13 original colonies? No, not really. Because the, the planet Saturn plays into the history of the United States. We were, it was founded according to the founding fathers and according to the, 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 the newspaper or, or, uh, items and newspaper articles and magazine articles in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, especially in the 1770s and 1780s when America was being founded. They had huge articles in the newspapers about the United States of America as the reestablishment of the Saturnian uh, system of government on the earth, devoted to the worship of the planet Saturn. That's what the articles talk about. I've got all kinds of, of newspaper clippings and magazine clippings from the 1770s talking about the planet Saturn as the guiding god of the United States. And it was the guiding light of the Roman Empire. And, and, and the symbol for Saturn, well, they had two major symbols for the planet Saturn, or the god Saturn. One was a black square, and one was the hexagram, the six-pointed star. So today, uh, we call the, the, the six-pointed star a hex, a hexagram. So when you hear the Jews talking about how they have been so mistreated over the years and thrown out of countries and all the persecution, it's because they are wearing a hex. The Babylonians used to wrap uh, would, would, uh, would, uh, on the ground, the ancient Babylonians would draw a circle on the ground and inside the circle draw a triangle. And then they would draw another triangle over that one, pointing the other way. And now it's a six-pointed hexagram, or a star of David, within a circle. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the symbol for Israel today. The old Babylonian, uh, Babylonian star of the planet Saturn. Saturn is the god of the Jews today. The Jews worship the planet Saturn. And Saturn's star is a six-pointed star or a hexagram, so we can say today that the Jews around the world wear around their neck a hex. They have the hex put on them. They put it on themselves, and they're proud to show you that they have a six-pointed star, which for thousands of years represented a, uh, a spell that is put on the human family. It was called a hexagram. And we today refer to it as somebody was put under, and we say it was a hex put on you. So they put a hex on you. Well, the Jewish people have a hex put on them. They think it's a star of David because they don't know any more about it than the Gentiles do. And right. Gentiles don't know any more about it than the Catholics do, and the Catholics don't know from nothing. And so when you start looking at the, uh, the, the uh, uh, original... Star of David goes back to the planet Saturn, and the Jews today still worship the planet Saturn. So That's okay. their main god today, right? And 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 their and their main god today is referred to as the god, the Lord of the Rings. Right. Why? Because Saturn is the Lord of the Rings, and and people were told the ancient, the old Jews were told to get married before their god so they would wear a wedding ring. The women were told to listen to their god Saturn so they wear an ear ring. And so we now know that this whole subject of Hollywood movie, uh, the Lord of the Rings, is the, actually the worship of the Jewish god Saturn. Mm. And this is why they... Saturn in the old Phoenician Canaanite language, the word, the, the word for the planet, we call it Saturn. But the way it was spelled in the old Canaanite language was Sabbat, S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H. Shabbat, S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H. Shabbat was the planet Saturn. And so today, if you're going to worship the planet Saturn, Lord of the Rings, uh, you do it on a day called the Sabbath. So therefore, the Sabbath is nothing more than the worship of Shabbat. And Shabbat is the Babylonian word for the Assyrian word for the planet Saturn, the six-pointed star, the one who puts the hex on you. 
wake up. The but, world is not what you think it is. No, There's sir. There's a whole world of knowledge you've never been invited to know about. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the other thing that they asked, though, was about the five-pointed star. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> which, to me... I think it's interesting that the five-pointed star yeah. has been called the flame... The, uh, what do they call it? The flaming star? Right. Uh, there was... Uh, and Elvis Presley even made a movie about it many years ago... Uh, can't remember the name of the movie. Something about the flaming star. And it was a five star, five pointed star, which is point, which is all part of uh, an esoteric understanding during the Middle Ages, when you have the man with the two legs, the two arms. I think it was Da Vinci that uh, drew that, uh, and it's been used for, uh, continually in, in well, history. It's, yeah, it's very simple. I mean, if you take a look at the Vitruvian man, or if you just take a look at your own body and you understand yeah. that you extend your two arms. I mean, listen, you have a middle section, so does the five-pointed star. The five-pointed right. star has five appendages, so do you. Uh, That's right. So to my understanding about the five-pointed star, this is this is a man. This is what this is. Um, now you could say this represents the elements. You could say, and, and there's a lot of people that have utilized this in various ways. Um, of course. but yeah. it's interesting that it is part of the symbolic, um, culture of America. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, like I said, the star is on the flag. You want to talk about Hollywood? Well, we have the walk of stars, right? Where we put people's names on the stars. That's right. Right. And why is it that it would be a five pointed star? There's no five pointed star in the sky. So, you know, it's not like it's a representation directly of something that can be seen in the sky exactly. No. But uh, but it does appear to me, and I do understand it, as the six compartments within the five-pointed star exactly uh, represent what a man's formation is. That's right. That's why Manly P. Hall wrote a whole book called Man is the Measure of the Universe, mm. period. The man, his body, a normal man's body is represented by the whole universe the whole understanding the deep understanding of the great wizards and the great minds of the ancient world understood that the human body represents that which is above is so below See, as now, above so below and a- so absolutely and and look yeah. i i understand all that but you know thinking of manly p hall because we're almost out of time but thinking of manly p hall again the, this idea that there was a future for this country that, uh, you know, was, was a special destiny. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. this was one of Manly P. Hall's, uh, cornerstones when it, when it That's came to exactly what it is right. he publicly wrote about. And, mm-hmm. uh, I, I believe this links to the idea of the, either the resurrection or the fruition of the, uh, the fable of Atlantis in a way. That's which is, exactly correct. And that's why he talked about the fact that the pyramid on the dollar bill mm-hmm. has is not the, the the capstone, which is the top triangle uh, on the on the dollar bill, is called the capstone uh, or the uh, the chief cornerstone. And Christians say Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. No, Jesus is not the cornerstone of the church. There are a lot of churches called the cornerstone church, but they got it wrong. Because the Christians uh, have no idea what that word cornerstone means. It's a corner of a building. It's a cornerstone. And it's the first block, it's the first brick, uh, first stone you lay. And then, depending on how that one is laid out, once you draw straight lines from it, that's the cornerstone of a church. Well, Jesus is not the cornerstone of the church. The Bible doesn't say that. It says twice in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Jesus in the New Testament is referred to as the chief, C-H-I-E-L, chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. But in the Old Testament, the uh, and I think it's in the book of Isaiah, one place, uh, the Messiah is referred to as the chief cornerstone. Not cornerstone, chief, C-H-I-E-F, don't forget it, hmm. chief cornerstone. And the chief cornerstone in the Hebrew theology, in the Hebrew Bible, if you take that word for chief cornerstone in Hebrew and go to a Bible dictionary and look it up, it will tell you 
the chief cornerstone was a symbol for Messiah, the Messiah of the Jews. And the symbol for the Messiah was a chief cornerstone, and it will tell you that's a triangle that sits on top of a pyramid. But it's not connected to the pyramid because it's above the pyramid. The pyramid represents the body of mankind. And that's why it's called a pyramid. Pyramid. Pyramid comes from two words. Pyra. P-Y-R-A. Pyra. Pyra is a fire, like pyro, pyromaniac, pyrotech. Pyra, P-Y-R-A, is a fire. And mid, M-I-D, is the middle. And so a pyramid means fire in the middle. Why? Because the fire of sexual generation is in the middle of the human body. It's a pyramid, fire in the middle. Get it? And once you understand that the fire in the middle is the creation of human life for the whole universe between male and female that causes humans to be here is the fire in the middle or the pyramid. And that the chief cornerstone is the ultimate power that decides uh, the ultimate destiny of the pyramid. But it doesn't touch the pyramid because it's above it. And so that's why it's called the chief cornerstone, and Jesus is connected to the chief cornerstone because he is the pyramid. And it's a very ancient story, a very fascinating when you get into it and see how the pyramid, the great pyramid of Egypt, is connected directly to Stonehenge. Stonehenge is the magic circle of stones. And if you draw a line straight from the from the back of the pyramid straight through the front door and, got, and draw a straight line, a laser line across the world, it will cross the Great Pyramid in Giza. And so that's why in the in the book of Isaiah it says in Isaiah nineteen nineteen that there was a that there was a pyramid in the middle of Egypt and God put it there and it said this is wonderful, it's God's work. It's a, it's a, I can't remember exactly the scripture, but it's Isaiah 19:19 19, 19, talks about the pyramid. So just keep in mind when you go to public buildings, uh, in restaurants and hotels and whatever, big uh, public buildings, you will always see a man's, uh, the men's room, the men's room is always a triangle. And the women's room is always a circle. The circle represents the stone hinge, the female. And the triangle on the men's restroom and public buildings represents the fire in the middle, men. And the fire in the middle is in the middle of the human body. So uh, you need to understand the dark secrets that's been hidden from you by the world's religions. They know all about the connection between the sexual generation for humans, the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill, and all of the dark sexual stuff that's going on today around the world, you really need to wake up and find out what the real truth is before you die. It would be interesting for you to find out what you don't know about the world you live in. Oh, absolutely. And that's what I've been trying to do, and that's why I have lost everything I own. I've lost everything. I have zero nothing. Why? Because I have sought all my life for one thing only, wisdom, knowledge. Where do things come from? Why do we believe what we believe? What do they really mean and where is it really found? And who started these different belief systems and who paid for them? And where did the churches come from? And where did these holy books come from? Mm. I'm telling you, eventually, if you did what I did, you would find yourself broke and homeless with nothing. Because I love searching for wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and I got what I wanted. I paid a hell of a price, but I got what I wanted. I wanted to know what all of this stuff is all about. Well, now I know, and I sit by myself in one room, broke with nothing. But at least I got what I wanted, and now I'd like to help other people before I leave here to understand the world you live in. It's not what you think it is. 
Not at all, but you can continue to learn by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com. That's jordanmaxwellshow.com. That is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. Other people use his name. Other people use his image. jordanmaxwellshow.com is Jordan Maxwell's website. Okay. Also, the Research Society over there, the donate button, the contact form. I advise you to use them all. <laughs> Join everything. Participate. Learn. Okay, Jordan has uh, been a remarkable resource for many years, but he certainly gathered a great deal of knowledge, and uh, he's sharing it with you. Okay, and uh, why would you turn it away? Unless you enjoy ignorance, which if you do, I don't know how you found my show. Okay, Jordan, you know, we're, we're out of time, but I do appreciate you doing this once again. This has been the seventh episode of this uh, series. And uh, we, we spent all of the time answering people's questions. I even formulated one of my own because I, I felt the need to. But um, certainly we'll continue right. to answer questions here and there, but this might be the only episode we devote to questions. Uh, well, but uh, I would say I love the questions. I love people because that tells me, uh, an old man who living by himself, that people – around the world are hearing me. I mean, it's very difficult for me to know who's hearing me because I'm just talking to myself most of the time. And so I just talk on the radio and hopefully somebody's hearing me and somebody cares about me and cares about what I'm trying to do. And so it's it's great hearing that people have questions and I love it. I mean, I'm very happy about it. And I, uh, you know, I'd like for people to write me and go on the email, write me and, and, and donate to me so I can stay alive and do my work and so I don't care how many times we have to do shows where we're just doing questions I think it's sensational I love it well I, so, I like I like spreading them out throughout the shows when we can because uh, but there just happened to be a good a good collection of them this week so yep. it was uh, it, it was apparently the right time to do it you know we're, we're not scripting any of this this is just going with the flow uh, and, right. you, and you, I knew you would be just fine with doing the questions tonight if that's all we got to. But I'm just saying that uh, next time we get together, we're going to have a, a bit more of an agenda. Um, yep. Okay. Now we that's might fine. not get together next week, right? But uh, I, I, we may, we may be able to. We might be able to because I was supposed to go to Los Angeles, but my ride uh, it, 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 it fell through, so I, I don't have a way to get to Los Angeles because I was going to be speaking at a conference. So I don't guess I'll be able to go, so I'll just stay where I am. And if that's the case, and it most likely will be, then I can do the show next week with you. Well, you know what? You'll let me know over the course of the week. If not, if right. not this Monday, then next Monday, one of these Mondays. If you're here on Mondays for now, this is what we're doing. Uh, yep. whenever Jordan is available and we're going to continue to, uh, stick to the subject of religion and exactly how it got to be the way it is. Uh, again, yes, certainly send questions to Jordan, send them to me, info at Ocelli.com, or I have a contact form as well. Um, but Jordan has a contact form. You can leave public comments, go to the chat room. I don't care where they come from. Uh, we will enter all of them into the discussion as long as they're reasonable. That's the only thing I ask. Okay. Yep. You know, it may, may make sure it's a reasonable question that has something to do with what we're talking about. Uh, and I think every single question that we took tonight had something to do with subjects either we were covering at the time or had already covered. So I think it was, uh, really productive. Well, I do too. And I, and I, and again, I would say join my research society because that's where I'm putting all of the, materials and pictures and documents and audios and videos and all the research stuff over the years. Yeah, I've got over a terabyte, which is a thousand gigs, ready to go on the on the web, but my web man can only do so much per day. Right. So I've got an enormous amount on there, but I got uh, terabytes yet to put on the website. So yeah, I've got a lot of stuff to, to try and help people to try and understand and a donation wouldn't hurt either if no. you if you have if you have like I, I appreciate said, yeah. any donations like i said do it do it all over there you know join the research society drop a donation in send an email take a look at the website uh i think all of these things would be absolutely good for you to do you the listener i mean not you jordan it's your website and it's the only website that is jordan maxwell's jordanmaxwellshow.com yes put all that together because it's the only website that is actually jordan maxwell